So what do I mean by a student's journey through learning? It sounds so magical and literary. I actually don't mean anything that uh, that beautiful. All I mean is that students start out in, um, listening. In the case of college students, it will be in a lecture hall like this. You know, school will be a little bit different. Then they might study at home for an exam. Then they would come take that exam. And then there's beyond, which is, you know, one day they may actually try to remember that information when they're working. Like, oh, yeah, I think I did this at school. Hmm. Uh, so that's what the student's journey through learning is. And how can cognitive psychology help? Well, you have, I'm sure, heard of the big two principles that have come out in terms of being the most effective, and those are retrieval practice and spacing slash interleaving. Spacing and interleaving are similar but slightly different. I'll explain in a minute, but I've just lumped them into, two, into one category, and I will explain those in a minute. So, again, you're very well informed, so you probably know what the retrieval practice effect looks like, but I will just show you very quickly how it is researched. So original research into retrieval practice started off by having students study in two conditions, so the, each row is going to be a condition. So first they did the exact same thing, they studied, and then at the end they both took a final test, but one of the groups just went straight to the final test, the other group took a practice test in the middle, and hey, guess what? Surprise, surprise, that group did better on the final test. Now, that's not terribly surprising because the first group did nothing. The second group took a practice test. Why wouldn't they do better, right? So then later research improved on that, and this is why we have science to come up with these control conditions by putting in a restudy control. Because now the idea is that, well, if you're getting to study something twice, you're getting exposed to the material two times. Meanwhile, the testing people, let's say they're not getting feedback. They're not really getting exposed to the material as much, so they theoretically ought to do worse. But what happens is that, at least at longer delays than immediately, people actually do better after that practice test, even without feedback, because the act of retrieving information from memory strengthens it. So that is the basic retrieval practice effect, and I know that it's gained a lot of popularity amongst teachers in the UK, not so much the US, um, so you probably mostly have heard about it. The spacing effect. Spacing, I've tried to represent it with these little boxes, going from left to right, from no spacing at all, to a little bit of spacing, to a little more spacing, and then at the end, uh, what's called expanded spacing. So first you have a smaller gap, and then you have a bigger one. That's the ideal. However, this is something I really want to mention. When we investigate this in experiments, we set up this very, very artificial scenario where, for example, that last condition over there will have students study something, then study it after a day, then after three days, and we're measuring performance only on those items and nothing else. In the real world, in the classroom, there's no way you could set up a scenario where you just teach your students something on day one and then that thing on day two, and then nothing else for a few days, and then that thing, right? That doesn't exist. So there's other stuff that's happening. So what's more realistic is that you're going to be doing interleaving if you're spacing. And then it starts getting very, very complicated because you, you've done the spacing, but then you have to fit in the other stuff. Um, and ultimately, it is very difficult for real life, you know, teaching scenarios to mirror these really specific spacing schedules that are studied in a lot of cognitive psychology. So that's a problem, I think, um, that needs to be addressed. But um, you, what you can do is to get two for the price of one and combine retrieval practice and spacing, and that is called distributed practice. So essentially what you could do is just introduce little quizzes um, throughout the term that cover some of the material from previous classes, and then you have the benefits of both retrieval practice and spacing, and theoretically, in, th in principle, your student should do better, or should they? Because this morning, as you know, my talk was already done, I have a, a more I'm going to say, of course, uh, I get a tweet, a Twitter notification. Um, oh, ace that test, Dr. Y, take a look at this paper. Well, okay, I'll take a look at the paper. No benefits of long lag repetition and retrieval practice were found in a primary school multi-classroom study. Uh, the results put into question the practical value of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I haven't even read this paper. I just thought I'd throw it up here to tell you, do not believe anything you say. I think the speaker before me said exactly the same thing. Uh, always question everything. Keep reading the literature. It's not proven. It's not set in stone. There may be some great explanations for why it didn't work in this particular scenario. The research may be flawed. They could have fabricated their data. I don't know. Um, but the, the point is that it's not going to work every single time, and it's not a law. 
However, let's just pretend that you know, I didn't mention that and talk again about the benefits of frequent quizzing. Because <laughs> wouldn't it be so much easier if it was just true and you know, I could come out here and tell you this is how it is, but I can't because that's just not how science works, unfortunately. We do, however, on the whole, tend to find lots of direct and indirect benefits of quizzing. Um, the direct one I've already told you about, the actual act of retrieving information from memory seems to cause additional learning. And then um, the, the spacing that comes from the frequent quizzing also delays forgetting. There are also some indirect benefits. This one is often played down. This is actually, I don't know about in the UK, but in the US, extrinsic motivation. So the motivation that students get from wanting to achieve a particular grade or getting rewarded for it, that's very uh, not in fashion. It's, it's not in vogue. It's like, oh, no, that's terrible. It can only possibly harm performance. That is not true. Um, sometimes it can help it. Sometimes it can dis distract, detract from intrinsic motivation, which is what we're all after, right? Getting students to actually love the material and want to get good grades for the, for the sake of it, not for the grade um, and want to learn it, but don't knock extrinsic motivation. It does help learning sometimes. Of course, and this is the main reason why a lot of teachers use quizzes, they give feedback in terms of what the students know and don't know so that the teacher can then change what they're, what they're teaching. And they also give feedback to the learner themselves, like, oh, now I know that I've learned this times table or whatever. Those two at the end are the most common reasons why teachers and students use quizzing, but, it, but there are also the direct benefits that are often ignored. So there are some questions that come up, though. Say we, we're all on board, the quizzing is in theory a good idea, except maybe not according to that paper. But let's say you want to use it, how should you use it? Which quiz format should you use could be one question. Should you use multiple choice or short answer questions as the practice? So Megan Smith, who, which is one, who's one of the other learning scientists, she compared uh, four different so she compared four conditions and then across four experiments. So this is important because it means that she's replicating her results. So we have reason to believe that they would replicate again if we did it for a fifth time. She had students do multiple choice practice questions, short answer practice questions, hybrid, which was um, short answer. So they attempt to answer it and then they get the choices and none, so they just reread the information. And the reason she actually set out to do this research was because she thought this hybrid um, form of questioning might be even more helpful than the other two because then you're having students make an effort to recall and if they can't, then they can use one of the options. But here's what happened, collapsing across all four experiments. There was really a tiny effect in terms of which type of questions helped, and this is performance a week later. What you see here, what you should spot immediately, is the fact that the study condition, the restudy on the right, is much, much lower than the other three, okay? So the other three is where they had any kind of testing. So ultimately, it doesn't seem to matter what type of test you give. It leads to, to a lot more learning than not giving a test. So don't worry about which type of test, just give one. However, there are some other considerations to take into account. If long-term retention is the same between multiple choice and short answer, how about actually implementing this in your classroom? You know, uh, creating multiple choice questions is a lot harder than we realize. And we have a blog post actually that collects a lot of resources on how to create good ones. And these resources range from like an article, you know, on a page in, on a website to a manual that's 150 pages long that you know, I, don't, I myself have not studied, but I'm sure if you did, then you would be much better at creating multiple choice questions. But that's really something to consider. It's hard to write good multiple choice questions. However, on the flip side, grading, which I guess you guys call marking, sorry, um, is a lot easier because you could just give an answer key, you know, they can self-grade. Uh, than short answer questions if you're going to be the one providing feedback if you have to take all that in a market. So there's a trade-off. I've often found myself where I think, do I want to do the work up front to create the, question, the uh, multiple choice questions um, or do I want to just do the work later for marking them? So there are other considerations to take into account, but long-term retention doesn't seem to be one of them if you're trying to pick which type of retrieval practice to give students. <laughs> 